watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. Yay! For the community, by the Hi, and Happy New Year. I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's episode, I have with me a newly published author, Pamela Glasner, and she's going to give us an insider's sneak peek into her new book, Finding Emmaus. Pamela, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming over. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Why don't you give us an overview of what Finding Emmaus is about? Okay, well, it is a dark, historical, fictional, but factual story about two people who live 300 years apart, and they find out in adulthood that they are not mentally ill as they believe themselves to be, and everyone around them had believed them to be, um, but actually possess an exceptional gift. And because of that, and because of the appalling things that happened to them during the time that they did believe themselves to be mentally ill, they each embark on a personal journey. They find a way to transcend time and death, actually meet each other, and then work together to save millions of others who have been and are being um, ostracized from society and victimized because they also are erroneously labeled mentally ill. So their gift is what people think is mental illness. The gift that they have is called empathy, being an empath, and uh, yes, it can appear to be to somebody who is uninformed or to the mm -hmm. untrained eye, uh, it can appear to be a form of mental illness, yes. So explain empathy, or what is an empath? An empath is somebody who experiences the emotions of another person as though those emotions are their own. So uh, let's say you're walking down the street mm -hmm. and you cross paths with um, cross paths with somebody who is very angry mm -hmm. and you're just walking down the street, you're fine. And proximity is not necessarily the only way to do it, but uh, for this example. So you cross paths with this person and you feel their anger. You don't know that it's not yours. So you just experience all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're angry. A few minutes later, you walk, you're, you're continuing down the street. Now you cross paths with somebody who just got the job of their dreams and they are euphoric. And you go from anger to pleasure, like a slingshot, with no clue why. Okay. So and if you don't know that you have this gift, you're just it's all gotta over be the place. All over the place, and it's got to okay. be terrifying. And if you do that often enough, I mean, imagine going to the mall at Christmas time and doing that. So just the parking lot at <laughs> the mall at Christmas <laughs> exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah, really, really. <laughs> you would never get in the mall. You'd go home. <laughs> or or O'Hare Airport in the middle of a sudden snow squall right. when everybody's yeah. at their best. <laughs> so it, what happens is your, your moods are all over the place, mm -hmm. and what empaths learn, now of course this is, is, is uh, a fiction, you know, the, the, so what empaths learn is very quickly is that the less time they spend around other human beings, the less often this happens. And so they isolate themselves. And so when you get all these major mood swings and you get lots of fear and you get um, self-imposed isolation, I mean, I'm an independent person, but I'm alone because I choose to be. Mm -hmm. That's very different than being alone because you're hiding behind your own four walls because you're terrified of what's going to happen if you go outside. And so just this general unwellness and we are social creatures. We're not, we're not, you know, the, we don't tend to be solitary beings, human beings. And so we just don't do well in solitary confinement. And so it looks from the outside looking in like mental illness, like and mental for the purposes illness. of my story, it specifically looks like bipolar disorder. Okay. So, so give us a little bit more detail of the two main characters of the book 
and this kind of transcending time piece of it. Okay. Uh, Catherine Spencer is in the 21st century and she is, she finds out, and I'm not giving anything away, I guess I yes, should say no, that, yes. right? Um, There's any, lots of mysteriousness <laughs> in this book that yes. we don't want to ruin the surprises. No, absolutely so, not. So we're not going to do that. So anything that I say is, is established very early in the story so that I'm not giving anything away. Catherine Spencer is 54 years old mm -hmm. and she's in the 21st century and she finds out at 54 uh, after having spent most of her life believing herself to have bipolar disorder and having failed treatment after failed treatment after failed treatment because number one you can't cure empathy number two you can't cure something you haven't got mm -hmm. um, she's getting treated for the wrong thing she's getting thing, treated for the wrong thing which there isn't a treatment exactly for okay. <laughs> exactly yeah. so she finds out at 54 that she she is told that she may very well be an empath 300 years earlier the other character in the story is Frank, although he would have been Puritan times, he would have been called Francis. But I call him Frank for a very good reason. And he is referred to as Frank from the, from the 21st century looking back. Mm -hmm. So Francis Nettleton is from the 1600s, born 1659. And he believes himself to be, and his family believes him to be mentally ill until he's in his 30s. And then it is suggested to him that he is an empath. And he goes on, literally, he goes on a personal journey and he goes on a physical journey to meet other empaths and create the lodestar, which a lo the word lodestar means guide. Okay. Um, and so he goes to create this um, physical manuscript, if you will, on how to, what it is to be an empath, how to live with it, how to teach other people so that they don't go through what he goes through. Because you know, back in the 1600s and the 1700s, if you were mentally ill, first of all, they called you a lunatic. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't use the word patient. And uh, lunacy, as everybody knew, was contagious. And uh, so that's why they were put in places like Bethlehem Royal Hospital so that they could be segregated from society. Or they were possessed by the devil, or they were witches, and so their lives were literally in jeopardy. Okay. So they were, there were some pretty awful things that happened to people who were considered mentally ill back in Frank's time. So once he learns that he has empathy, he is an empath, then yes. he wants to help others because he's been suffering yes. his, his whole life. Exactly. Okay. Um, and this takes place in? Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> All of it. Yes. In fact, it takes place mostly in Weathersfield, but I changed the name. Okay. Uh, I call in Frank's time, in, in Francis's time in the 1600s, it was uh, called Duncaster. And then in present day, I call it Weaver's Bridge. Okay. But it does, all, it takes place between Wethersfield, Newington, and Hartford. Hartford's the only town that I leave the name alone. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the midst of reading, reading it, and Hartford is indeed in the book. Yeah. Um, so you brought a reading for us. So I, want, I want our viewers to get a feel for how exciting <laughs> that it does. It draws you in and you want to find out what happens. So why don't you yeah, my pull pleasure. out the section that you brought okay. um, from Finding Emmaus and we can get a flavor of what, um, of what, it just what the okay. feeling of the book is. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, uh, this is actually Frank from the, uh, let me see this from the 20th. So this would have been 1679. Um, and I would like to preface this with uh, there, are, there, there are a few excerpts in the book actually written in the dialect of 1679, of the 1600s. And they're cumbersome to write and even more cumbersome to read. And so I decided uh, pretty early on that I was going to kind of follow the format of the movies that were made in the 1940s and the 1930s where people sounded a lot more formal Yes. but did not necessarily sound, they didn't necessarily sound as if they were English because I don't know how to write with an English accent and I didn't want to do it wrong. So, so that's the way you make the distinction of the earlier right, so period of history. Exactly. Okay. So when somebody is reading Frank's section, they know that they're reading Frank, and when they're reading the Catherine sections of the book, they know they're reading Catherine. So we should also say the book is in two different voices. It's first person Frank from his period of time and then... Third person, third person Catherine in her period, in her of, time. period of time, and then eventually 
and eventually they, they both get together. Okay. Yes. So okay. this is Frank's section. So this is Frank. Okay. <clears throat> I had thought before entering the Kittredge home to tell them everything, recount the details of each conversation, describe each battle, lay out the events as they'd occurred, how the news had worsened with each passing day. I had thought it might be easier if I could make them understand what I had been facing, stupidly thinking it might lessen the blow. What a fool I'd been. There was no salve for this wound I'd chosen to inflict. She was already suffering and I had yet to utter one word. Whatever I said from that point forward would have been for my sake only, would do nothing to ease her pain. No amount of intellect was going to fix this. What, I, what, it, what finally di did issue forth from my mouth without preamble was clumsy and tactless. I cannot marry you. I love you, but I cannot. There was too much space between us. I felt a sudden desperate need to hold her. My hands reached out for her, begging her forgiveness. Every bit of color had drained from her face. Her mother saw this at the same time as I and caught her daughter before she slipped to the floor. I moved to assist her, but her father blocked my way, simply saying, you've done enough. I think you should leave now. He knew. I had no doubt of it. Even without the immediate, even without the intimate details, he knew about the kiln, about Robert Chapel, about the money, about the terrible choices I was forced to make. Ours was a small, tight-knit community. Everyone knew. I wanted to believe that he understood that what I did, I did for my family. And what he did now as he held my arms and blocked my way, he did for his. Just leave, he choked. Please. It was a final goodbye from a man I'd loved as long as I could remember. One more casualty to add to my list. But I wanted to explain. Explain what? I had no answer. All I could do was stand there, look beyond him at the wife and daughter he now sought to protect from me. It was unthinkable that this should be happening. Just days ago, these people were my family. My sister appeared at my side and walked me to the door. With my hand on the latch, I hesitated and tried to think of something to say, but could not. In the end, Anne took my hand, led me out, and closed the door gently behind us. It was a sound I took to my grave. Very nice. Thank you. So he is um, a sound he took to his grave. He's writing this. It's almost like he's writing it after he's dead. dead. Mm. So he's there's a little bit of a ghost element. Well, the book starts out, the year is 2008, and I am, as I have been for the last 251 years, 98 years old. So it's established in the very first sentence that he's a spirit. He's a spirit, and he's try still trying to help people in his situation. He is unfulfilled because there were three things he wanted to accomplish in his life, and that's this is established in the first page of the book. Um, there were three things he wanted to accomplish, and I won't say what they are, but one of them was getting the lodestar into in, the right in, hands. Into the right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 disseminated, get the getting information disseminated so that people would not go through what he went through. So I'm interested on the, this idea of empaths and empathy. And I, I did a, a very brief Google search, because, you know, source of all knowledge, right? Right. Um, and it did come up. Empathy did come up. And there were some websites that were talking about if you're experiencing these things, mm -hmm. you may have this empathic gift. gift. So how did you come to know about it? Did, did it come to you after you had the thought for the book? Did it, was it something you'd heard about? How, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I knew I wanted to write about empaths. Okay. Um, I am, um, and there are a lot of people like me, I am very sensitive to the world around me. Mm -hmm. And I have what I consider to be empathic talents, gifts, a curse, mm -hmm. qualities, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes it's wonderful, sometimes it's awful. Okay. Um, so I knew I wanted to write about that. And I had done some research mm -hmm. on the web. Uh, you're right. Google is kind of like the be all and the end all. <laughs> Everything. You at least get an idea of both ends of the spectrum of exactly. whatever you're looking for. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem, though, with it is that there are a lot of self-proclaimed experts, yeah. and so you don't necessarily get 
great information. So what I did was I took my own personal experiences, combined them with some of the things that I read, combined them with my own imagination, and came up with a definition for empath and some of the things that empaths can do. And they're kind of, and they're woven into the story. Um, so I knew that I was going to write about that. And then I knew that I was also because it can make you feel crazy, knew that I was going to compare it with people being victimized and ostracized because of a misconception of mental illness. And so, and specifically bipolar, because I had understood my limited knowledge of bipolar disorder at the time was that uh, mostly the mood swings. Yes, that was you're up, you're down. Exactly, you're exactly. I mean, of, yeah. When people Quickly, think of yeah. bipolar disorder, I think that's th like the first thing that yes. they think about. So I started doing research about mm -hmm. bipolar disorder, and that was really a, an amazing eye-opener. I, I researched this book to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. Everything about the book is researched. I mean, I, and I did, I actually got to go to England to do some of the research, which was, that was really tough to take, right, let yeah, me right, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to write a book about I know, Spain, I know, or I, I don't know. know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but I, I, I was only going to get a, enough information so that I could at least write about bipolar disorder and sound and reasonably right. intelligent. And have the basics right. A and mm -hmm. what I started finding out was appalling. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't stop reading. And the book kind of, in a lot of ways, the book wrote itself. The book took on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. When I first started writing the book, I don't know where you are in it, so I don't want to mess things up for you, but the end of the book is the original beginning of the book. Uh, the part where it's Catherine and Frank together. Together, yeah. After you start, after you read into that part, um, the, it, it eventually comes to the part that was the original beginning of the book. Hmm. And it just, and it was good, I liked it, but it wasn't good enough, I just wasn't knocking my socks off. And can I? I yes, have a picture. Yes, sure. Oh, absolutely. You have a picture, okay? Yes, I have a picture. Let's see if we can, we can um, hold that up. So we'll up. hold that up. That mm -hmm. is the original Frank. Okay. He was a, um, he's, he's passed away now, I'm uh -huh. sure, because that, that's a piece of, that's a picture of a piece of art that I have in my house that I've had for 25 years. And that gentleman actually used to sit inside a covered bridge in Vermont and weave baskets. And the name of that piece of art is The Basket Maker. And I was just trying to think of how I was going to take my story about Catherine Spencer and just and, and about empaths and just really make it different and powerful. Right. And I looked at that and I said, OK, I'm going to name the town that's Frank and he's a weaver. I'm gonna name the town Weaver's Bridge. And he's the father of empathy. He wrote the book on it. Yeah. And all of this stuff just popped, popped into my and head. It just and all came to it you. It just all came to me. That's amazing. So I have a quote too. Um, uh, your book was reviewed by Christopher Belton. Um, and there's a sentence here that I think is interesting. And you started alluding to some of this and I want you to, to go a little bit further. His quote says, it is an inspiring saga of history, adventure, religion, politics, suspense, mystery, and romance, all neatly wrapped up in a compelling conspiracy of which Michael Crichton <laughs> would have been proud to have conceived. So there's a lot in there. Yes. What I want you to talk a little bit about is um, the um, conspiracy piece of it. Because you started alluding to it when you were researching the mental illness and, and the um, bipolar disorder. I found out through my research that, I mean, I know that there are, I know people connected with me in one way or another who are um, dealing with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And I have heard little things here and there, but I never heard it to this degree. And I started reading diaries, and I started reading information from the CDC, mm -hmm. Center on Disease Control. Mm -hmm. And I found out that of all of the psychotropic medications that are out there. And, and now it, so let's define psychotropic. So that's psychotropic something. medications are medications that are used specifically to treat um, mental 
illnesses. Illnesses, at, okay. Ex and I say the word treat with quotes because this is what you. This found is what out. I'm. This is what okay. I found out. Seventy percent of the time, they do not have their desired effect, okay. and that's not me saying that. That's the CDC saying that. There was congressional testimony. There's been research, all the way back into the '60s, um, and and it's almost 100 percent of the time, though they have hideous side effects. Hmm. And the more that I read, the more appalled I became, and it that became woven into the mm -hmm. fabric of the story because then not only was it a story of people being mistaken for mentally ill, mm -hmm. it became a story about what happens to you. Back in the 1600s, the doctors really did believe that the way to treat lunacy and bring somebody back to good health was to physically torture them. And I get, I don't know if you've gone to that part yet. I but have not. And you I know you not. told me that it's there. And I keep thinking, oh, am I coming to the part? Get, <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> yeah, I get into very, very graphic descriptions yeah. of the tortures. And that information is readily available. Well, right. So this is not a book for younger readers. Oh, no. Oh, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, th that information is available. I'm actually spoke, I actually worked with the archivist from Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Mm -hmm. And that those, those, uh, those records are available. And there are drawings of the, uh, the machines that they used to put people on and how they used to torture them. And, and, that go, and I get into that. Mm -hmm. Now in the 21st century, or back in the 20th century, we torture them in a different way. We do it with pills mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and in other ways. Um, but the conspiracy theory is the, pharma, the ph psychotropic um, industry, because the pharmaceutical industry encompasses a lot of other medications besides psychotherapeutics. Right. Uh, but the psychotherapeutic industry in the United States um, in four years went from a $12 billion industry to a $70 billion industry. Now at a time when everybody else is uh, outsourcing and laying off people and, and, and just, I mean, it, Every, uh, Other industries falling are shrinking, apart. Every, right. Uh, right, right. Uh, downsizing and whatever. Right. This industry is just booming with a product that fails 70% of the time. Mm. So, I mean, if you opened up, if you had a case of Coca Cola and you opened the, and 70% of the time you didn't like the taste, how, or 70% of the time you took cough medicine and it didn't stop your cough, how long do you think those products would remain on the shelves? Right. But it's common knowledge that the FDA gets financial incentives from the pharmaceutical industry to bypass a lot of the testing and get the drugs on the market sooner than they should be mm -hmm. so that they can make a profit. Yeah. I mean, so that's a big. Huge. So that, yeah. Huge. So compelling conspiracy is probably a good, <laughs> a good description. I don't know and about the Michael Crichton part. I was very flattered <laughs> that by that. That is flattering. <laughs> that's, 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 that's compelling too. Um, so there's a lot that you're covering in this book. And um, you have shared with, it's a trilogy. So you started writing this and you had so much material. You decided to do a second book and then realized that it was actually going to go into a third book, right? Well, yes. So I you're hoping to have it be... I knew it was going to be two books mm -hmm. because I, I, it would have been 1,500 pages long. Right. And so I knew it had it, so I just looked for a likely place for a commercial break and stopped. Mm -hmm. And then my husband and I were having dinner at Bertucci's and he said, hey, what if you did this and such at the end of book two? And I said, oh my God, what a great cliffhanger yeah. ending. So now I know there has to be a book three. That's how that came about. So you're in the midst of book two now? I'm in the midst of book two now, yes. Okay, so what is your, I mean, give us a little bit of an insight. I'm always curious. I, I hear writers being interviewed all the time on the radio and, and on TV, and one author I remember specifically saying, the hardest part about being a writer is keeping your tush in the chair, because you're just, you're sitting at home, you're by yourself, you're staring at the computer or the paper, and it's just like, oh, I gotta go do laundry, or oh, I gotta go do this. What is your experience with getting it on the page? The hardest part for me was walking away from the page. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is your experience as the total Groceries opposite. didn't get bought. Food didn't get cooked. Dog didn't get walked. I mean, you know, my husband's like, you know, laundry's not getting done because right. Pamela, dinosaurs could have walked down the street past my house. I never would have had the slightest clue. <coughs> I couldn't stop writing. 
Yeah. So, so not writing really was not inspired. my problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, having the rest of my life was my problem. Right. So how long did it take? I mean, this is you. This book itself is over. So well over 300 pages. It's 448 here. When right. I wrote it, it was 762. But through the miracle of formatting with computers, I mean, they can literally take the letter A <laughs> and do this with it and make less room between the lines. And they, they really want to. So when most people are trying to spread it out, you're trying to get it smaller. <laughs> well, they didn't want it to be a physically. It's hard to hold yes. a 1,500 page book yeah. or even a, a 700 page and book. And if you're like my husband and you fly a lot, you don't want to carry. Super heavy book. A super heavy on book. Plane. And and yeah. the booksellers don't want to put a thicker book in the bookstore. Too much shelf space. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they literally they didn't take anything out, but they shrunk it down from seven hundred and sixty two pages wow. to four hundred and thirty eight. <clears throat> so it was um, So you're so now you're working on the second one. Now I'm working on the second okay. book and it will probably be Another just as long. I knew. I knew. Terrific. I would say about 200 pages in. Uh -huh. I knew that it was going to be. Um, I knew that it was going to end yeah, up being a lot very, very out. long. Well, you're covering a lot of material. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, when I talked about how I researched it, I really wanted people to feel like they were there. Yeah. So when Frank goes on his journey, he gets into a cargo ship because mm -hmm. they didn't have here in uh, America. They weren't had, had didn't have luxury ships. You know, passenger ships. <coughs> Excuse me. So he gets on this cargo ship and he goes down the Connecticut River, referred to as the Great River in mm -hmm. my book. And, and I talk about the different ports that he goes to, that he gets to in Connecticut and then mm -hmm. all the way to New York. And I actually worked with a mariner, an experienced mariner, who told me if he was on a cargo ship in the 1600s, this kind of a ship with you know, changeable right. weather, this, that, and the other thing, this is about how long it would have taken to get from this port to this port to this port. This is what he would have seen. This is what, how, the book yeah. would have, how the boat would so have been provisioned. Very, it's very, even though it's fiction, it's factual. Is what yes, say. very. So <coughs> we're, we're just about out of time. So I knew it was going to go fast, <laughs> and there's so much more we could talk about. But if um, my viewers want to get more information about you or your book, they can go to your website, right? Yes. Which is www.lodestar.com. And it's the Old English spelling, L-O-D-E-S-T-A-R-R-E. -R -R -E. -E. And you're also on Facebook. Yes, Pamela and Glasner without the S-K. So they search Pamela Glasner. That's yeah. fantastic. Good luck on the second book. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I can't wait to, to find out what that exciting <laughs> ending is. Um, I'm Sarah Connor. You've been watching Life and Style with Sarah. Don't forget to tune in next month for a brand new episode. Maureen Hazley Jones, the English lady, will be back and she'll be hel helping us to have some happy houseplants. Thanks and good night.